I'm George Galloway, and I present Kali Mahorra on Al Maidin Television. Here we are in London. I speak my words freely, either in Parliament, on television, here on the streets of London. Kali Mahorra means free words. That's what I speak. So Kali Mahorra is a two-way conversation. Check it out on Al Maidin Television. Welcome to Kale Mahorra with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London, talking about China. China is already, arguably, the most important country on the earth, the biggest population, the biggest economy, and the biggest army. And in the lifetime of the youngest viewer of this program this evening, it will be preeminently so, incontestably so. This is a reality which some in the West are finding difficult to handle. And indeed, they're doing everything that they can to slow the progress to that inevitable end. Whether it's economic sanctions against Huawei, excluding Chinese technology from Western economies, whether it's finding one uh, cause celebra or another, one day it's the Falun Gong religious sect, the next it's Tibet, the Dalai Lama, and most recently uh, the vexatious question of China's Muslim minority. We'll come back to that in just a couple of minutes. But China is beginning now to influence political decision-making in a way that even a few years ago was difficult to imagine. Chinese people uh, followed the rubric of uh, when your strong appear weak, when your weak appear strong, and they take things very cautiously and carefully. But I'll tell you the moment when I realized that things had begun to change. When the David Cameron's Conservative government in Britain tried but failed to persuade the British Parliament to launch bombing raids on the government of Syria and its armed forces, the British government were working themselves into a lather over China's policy towards the matter. I was a member of Parliament at that time, and I well remember, as a foreign affairs specialist, being invited to a private briefing from the then Foreign Secretary, William Hague, who told us with great exasperation that he had been trying to reach the Chinese Foreign Minister on the telephone to try to persuade him to support British involvement in the war against the government of Syria. And Mr. Hague informed us in sorrow and in anger that the Chinese foreign minister simply refused to come to the phone to talk to him. Instead, he sent a functionary, his personal secretary, to tell the British foreign secretary there are no circumstances in which China will support the bombardment of Syria. And I remember thinking at the time that this insult to the former great colonial power uh, of Great Britain marked something of a turning point. And in the few years since, China has begun to put its foot down in the political sphere. It has begun to show, I was going to say acquire, but certainly show a political weight commensurate with its economic weight, its population weight, its strategic importance. And we'll be looking at that subject today. China is a gigantic success story. The government of China has lifted more people out of poverty than any system, any government ever has in the entire history of the human race. China is a buzzing, humming economic power, and it is beginning to be obviously so even to the least astute of Western observers. That's not to say that there is 
nothing wrong with China's policy at home or abroad. I argue that the most significant potential weakness for China is the Muslim question in China, which many of you watching this today will already be familiar with. You won't necessarily be familiar with the true facts, but you will be familiar with the general narrative that is being spun, namely that China is suppressing, oppressing its Muslim minority, uh, the Uyghur people in Xinjiang and other Chinese Muslims, that China launches an annual war on Ramadan, uh, stopping people from worshipping, stopping them from fasting. Uh, I even saw a meme the other day that China is forcing Uyghur Muslims in China to drink alcohol. Most of that is complete nonsense. It's Western propaganda, but not all of it. And I have some history in this regard. In the 1990s, early in the 1990s, before anyone in the West had ever heard of the name Osama bin Laden, I gave a lecture to the International Department of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party, warning them that a US turn against China had begun and that bin Laden and the Islamist trend that he represented was being pointed at China because already with the failure of the Falun Gong, the failure of Tibet, some wedge had to be found by Western imperialist countries to be driven into China to try and slow, if not halt, China's apparently inexorable advance. I remember it well because uh, even the Chinese party functionaries that I was talking to had never heard of Osama bin Laden. They certainly didn't know how to spell his name because they queued up around me uh, for the English spelling uh, of his name. It is true that the West is using China's Muslim problem to damage China, but it is also true that the Chinese government is handling its Muslim question far from perfectly. But that's not the only issue. We're going to talk uh, this, this evening about the Belt and Road Initiative, which essentially, and on the face of it, certainly, is a non-imperialist policy of linking up the world through transport, infrastructure, industrial investment, to try and allow these countries in which, particularly in Africa, China is heavily involved, though it's heavily involved in Latin America too, to try and strengthen the infrastructure of these countries to the mutual benefit of everyone. And that's good. But there are concerns in Africa in particular that this could turn at some date in the future into a kind of new imperialism, a new colonialism. There is a sense in some places amongst some people in Africa that China is becoming rather too ubiquitous in their uh, economies and in their societies. Uh, until now, China has shown not a scintilla of interest in interfering in anybody else's political affairs. On the contrary, China maintains and has always maintained good relations, if I take a country like Pakistan, for example, with any and all regimes that have come to power, either legally, democratically, or by military coup. And China has treated those governments, those regimes, exactly the same, maintaining that its policy is of friendship towards the people. Uh, of Pakistan rather than uh, any government which is, of course, here today and gone tomorrow. We have an audience here this evening of distinguished experts and one or two enthusiastic amateurs like me. So let's kick off the debate on China's Belt and Road Initiative, what it means and what kind of China are we seeing now more and more clearly 
in the light. Let me start with you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, David Otto. I am an anti-terrorism and organized crime specialist for Global Rex International. Um, I, I thank you very much for the discussions you're talking about, especially uh, when we talk about China that is um, emerging, or, you know, so, so to speak, or actually the, uh, giant, one of the giant nations in the world. Um, uh, especially when you, you talk about the internal dynamics, because there is no nation that would be as powerful as the U.S. used to be or is, or the Great Britain used to be, and it is, uh, without having a very powerful internal um, uh, economy and internal stability. And this is what China has been working on. It used to be referred to as the sleeping giant you know, of the world, but that giant has now arose. And the internal strategy which China has been using has been in such a way that with its uh, you know, huge population than any, any, any continent or any country in the world, they've managed to stabilize the country to, in such a way that it allows them to go externally and, and come into the building of the Silk Road, which you know, inevitably is going to cost more than 900 million US dollars. Now, the reason why China is doing that, again, as you said, perhaps could be for um, you know, helping other countries in Africa or in the Middle East or in Europe to develop their internal economies. But primarily, there is no friendship. There is no enmity. China does that for its own interest, primarily. Secondary, perhaps, you know, and, and again, it's, it's may perhaps it is doing that to assist or, you know, create the globalization that it talks about. Uh, but when you look at the stick that China gets, the reason for that is because, you know, uh, most countries like the United States, they are the superpowers when it comes to uh, military progress. You know, Great Britain, um, you know, uh, they did very well during the days of colonization. They colonized most of the world and they made their name out of that. China is looking to make its name out of its economic um, uh, infrastructures, out of its economic investment, because they That's believe a bit that. That's healthier, isn't it? Of course. I mean, they believe that the only way for them to compete. Um, you know, on, on the same platform with, you know, the United States and, and with Great Britain is for them to expand economically. They have uh, the, the, the people, the numbers game on their side. They have the population that can, can consume some of these um, uh, economic benefits that they will be bringing to China. They have the money to spend, the fiscal cash to spend. They are comparing, um, you know, uh, to, head to head with the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. So I think, the, you know, the position that China is is placing itself is is no doubt a serious threat, you know, I may say, to you know the United States because uh, and, and Great Britain, of course, and other superpowers. Um, but again, you know, the uh, this is all about geopolitics. Uh, this is all about China's personal interest. If I were to advise other countries, you know, I would tell them to strike a deal that would be beneficial to their economies, that would be beneficial to their people, because China will not do any deal that would not be beneficial to his people. And that's where I think China stands. Excellent uh, introduction. Thank you for that. Adam Gary, you are uh, the head of Eurasia Future. You specialize in this uh, field. Um, how do you see this new China that is more and more clearly being seen in Western capitals? Well, I see the new China as the antidote to some of the biggest problems that the world is facing today. Now, a lot of people talk about the word fascism, and fascism is back in a way, and the form that it has taken is the zero-sum mentality. And this isn't the fascism of the beer hall, and it's not the fascism of marching soldiers. It's the fascism of a mentality that says, in order for me to be rich, you need to be poor. In order for me to be secure, you need to be destroyed. In order for me to be impenetrable, you need to be molested. This zero-sum mentality, which expresses itself in the fields of trade, protectionism, economics, finance, the all-important but too little discussed monetary policy, and of course the ubiquitous military sector, is very much at play in the world today. Now, China proffers something that's the antithesis of the zero-sum mentality. This is the win-win mentality, which says if we're able to make a peaceful world, and if this is something that collectively mankind should strive for, there's got to be a solid and sustainable foundation. This foundation is prosperity, because when someone is poor, there's usually an element of exploitation involved. And inversely, when one is prosperous, there's usually a placidity which sets in the ether and eventually is able to change the very enlightened spirituality, if I can use that word, 
word of men and women and indeed of children. This is the philosophical essence of Belt and Road. Finally, I should say, there's no coercion involved, which makes Belt and Road very different from the systems that were employed by the British Empire, the American Financial Empire, the Wall Street and City of London empires, which answered to neither of the previous two. It's the other way around. In fact, there's no coercion, no political strings attached, no military alliances. It's merely about economic development and people-to-people -people development. Trevor, you, uh, uh, you, with your economist uh, hat on, an economist of note, is that how you see it? Is it as entirely benign as Adam Gary thinks it is? Uh, short answer is no. I think it's far more complicated than that. Um, so I'd like to say a few things about your introduction first, or did I'd like to say a few things about Belt and Road, if I may. Uh, in, your, in your introduction, I, I totally agree that China has become far more important in the world economy. It should become more important. It deserves to be, given its, its size in terms of population and economy, as you said. But it is not the world's largest economy. It's still the U.S. The U.S. is 18 trillion uh, uh, dollars uh, a year. Uh, China's around 11 or 12 trillion. It's only if you adjust for what we call purchasing power parity, which is differences in inflation, does China surpass the U.S. But in terms of its, 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 its economy, uh, the U.S. is still by far the world's most important economy. And that, that has to be said. Um, and China's population is large, but it's been rapidly caught by uh, India, for example, it, it's, a, it's, it's an important nation and should be regarded as such and should be taken seriously, absolutely. Um, on its um, current Belt and Road Initiative, well, it's, it's about projecting its economic power. It is about uh, being able to get access to goods because it needs large amounts of imports of raw materials to fuel its growth. But it's also about access to the markets for its goods. And it's creating something which will benefit the countries that it is dealing with, but also benefit it. So it is about uh, forming strong relationships. But with those strong relationships will come more power. It will have a say in what happens in those economies. And you are right to point to the fact that in Africa there are doubts about uh, the pervasiveness of its power, its relationships with some of the elites, the quality of some of the work which is done, for example, some of the roads which have been built are already falling apart. It uses its own labor rather than employing locals. It's about whether or not that money that it spends in those countries benefits those countries specifically or just gets benefits mainly to uh, the Chinese. So there are big political and social issues which will come out of this. But that is the nature of the world. It is also the nature of power. By the way, I do think that it is right to spend that money. I do think it's a counterweight to some of the, the faults that the West has, although I wouldn't paint the West as monolithic, George, as you do, because I think there are big differences between the US as it's incarnated at the moment and was a few years ago, and also between what Europe thinks about some of what's going on and what the US thinks about some of, some of what's going on. So the world is far more nuanced and complex than just these sheer blocks that we talk about. But I do think that China has a huge problem, and the problem is it's not democratic. How does it... Uh, mutate into a democratic state where its people have a say in how they govern. At the moment, it is totally driven by the fact that to legitimize the hold of the Communist Party in power in China, it has to deliver ever higher levels of living standards. And that is its imperative. And I do think it's treating the Uyghurs uh, badly. I do think that's the beginning of some sort of uh, police state in that part of China. But that part of the, the country is vitally important to it. It's 40% of its energy. So there's hard power realities that have to be taken into account as well. And that's my preamble. There's lots more to say. No, go on. But as, a, uh, as an introduction, I think that maybe I should stop there and then um, maybe we can continue as the debate. Please, as you please. Uh, Adam Gary, the, uh, the, the picture that Trevor paints is, is rather different to yours. Maybe you're right, maybe he's right, maybe the truth lies in between, but how would you immediately respond? Well, I would say that managerial issues need to be separated from the overall aim. When building any business, when with building any country, it would be more scandalous and more shocking if everything went swimmingly without any, without any surprises, without any shocks. Such a state doesn't exist on Earth. People are fallible. And China, as a very rational society, based on the very rational form of government that's existed from the time of Dong Xiaoping to 
to the age of Xi Jinping thought is one that is willing to correspond and liaise with all of its partners. If a road isn't built to scratch, there will be dialogue and it will be rebuilt. When the first generation of an infrastructural project requires foreign workers, the second and third will see that balance redressed. We have to remember, too, that it's totally fallacious to hold China both internally and in terms of its developmental partnerships to the same standards to which one holds countries that have achieved first world status after centuries of wars, of genocide, of holy wars, of slavery, and of all sorts of suffering that between 1949 and the present day hasn't existed in China. So if we're going to compare records, not only has China developed quicker, but with the problems that are necessary in all developing societies, I think China's record, frankly, is a lot better than some of the countries which today are part of the first world, which China, as China itself says, is not yet part of the first world. Well, China was, of course, <laughs> occupied by the first world. It was sacked, exploited, invaded, literally occupied, with sovereignty uh, asserted. Uh, Great Britain, in the last 120 years, literally took parts of China and said that's no longer China, it's Britain. Britain bombarded China to force China to accept heroin from our empire in India. And that kind of criminal rape, actually, of China is not a distant memory. The Chinese People's Republic only came into being in the lifetime of some people actually watching this program. There was a period of ultra-left uh, politics in China which achieved uh, some gains, made many mistakes. The modern China we're actually talking about here now is only... What's the Deng Xiaoping uh, period? We're, we're talking 40 years. So in 40 years, China has emerged in the shape it's in now and should be judged uh, accordingly. Now, uh, do, do you want to quickly respond? Uh, I think what we have to agree is that democracy is not for every country. Uh, the Chinese economy has been able to develop, you know, uh, you know, aside from the type of democracy that we expect, you know, uh, to happen in China that happens in the West. You know, I've just been to China a couple of months ago, and you can tell that, of course, there are, you know, the social media is restricted, you know, but when you meet the people in China, they don't express any, uh, some, any, any sort of, you know, oppress, oppression uh, style regime that, you know, the West always paints that to be. So I don't think democracy is, you know, the level of judgment that we can use to characterize, you know, how well a nation is doing. Uh, but of course, if you want to talk about democracy, it's a system where the majority rules over the minority. So if, you know, you go to China, you would find that the majority are happy, the minority may not be happy. So it's still the same uh, system of government that runs. Much more coming up after this. You're watching Kalim O'Hara with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin, talking about China. Earlier, we took the Kalim O'Hara camera onto the streets of London to see what the people thought. Let's take a look. <laughs> What do you know about the Chinese New Silk Road? I'm sorry, I don't know anything about the... Um, I don't know about that. I don't really know enough about it to be able to say anything meaningful about it, to be honest, so... Sorry. Oh, <laughs> uh, well... <laughs> uh, I never hear about it, so... Is it true? I just heard about Silk Road. Uh, the China wanted to 
uh, expand their strengths. Maybe it's a way of protecting themselves or expanding their um, commercial link with more countries, making sure that uh, the more trade they can do, the better it will be for their uh, economy and, uh, and money. Uh, it's basically a role that they're using to connect the world and, you know, by sea or land. And yeah, which I honestly don't support because I honestly, it's I think it's gonna cause more pollution that the world already has dealing with. Um, I believe it's gonna be made in 2049. Um, they're trying to build some sort of connection between um, China and other countries such as Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and other countries as well, um, in order for like stock trade and um, travel and stuff. I think. Will the new Silk Road only benefit China or the whole world? Uh, in case of uh, northern uh, path, it benefits only China because they are planning to make a train connection to North Sea, to Helsinki, and uh, make a tunnel to Tallinn and then go uh, in the middle of Europe. And uh, 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 it's kind of awful dominant thing to the next hundred years. Um, I feel that it will definitely um, be a positive advantage to countries, so not just to China, it would be uh, an advantage to Pakistan, Sri Lanka and the other countries definitely um, in terms of stock trade um, as well as travel maybe as well. So um, yeah, definitely an advantage to other countries, not just China. Uh, why do you think the US opposes the new Silk Road? Okay. Um, it could be in terms of maybe uh, feeling a threat as well as not having control over what's happening there in terms of like travel maybe uh, and stock trade and stuff like that but definitely a big threat maybe I would say as they don't feel that they would be in control as much. I think it's because of the economic power that they believe if, if, if China gets this it's going to be an upper hand. And the U.S. in general, they like to be in charge of everything. Well, I think China needs to invest a little bit in its uh, public relations because uh, not many people know uh, about the subject that we're talking about. Uh, Madam, you had a, a question. Thank you. It was. It was. A, I don't know how relevant this is, but um, earlier you spoke about the IMF and the Infantry Monetary Fund, which is obviously the world regulated bank. Do you think that is? Does, did you think that holds a certain responsibility that they're ignoring in this particular on this particular subject? Well, I think the balance is shifting. The uh, Asian financial development uh, infrastructure is becoming far more important than the IMF and the World Bank as the political balance in the world uh, shifts. And there's no doubt what the IMF and the World Bank do with their money. Yeah. They bludgeon the countries that they Absolutely. lend to uh, into uh, absolute uh, surrender to their prevailing economic and political uh, modes in a way which actually the Asian development banks don't do. So um, we're not comparing China's uh, approach to these matters with uh, a group of saints. Uh, you know, this is the, the IMF and the World Bank, I would argue, uh, are international criminals over the last 50 years in the way that they have destroyed any possibility of uh, a fair, a balanced, a just international order in poor countries. That's my own view, don't have to accept it. Let's take the gentleman in the middle. Yes, sir. Yes, my name is Rashmi, the orange one. I just want to ask the question. After listening to all the gentleman was saying, and you also, and then we come to the conclusion is one bell and one road is a good initiative that it will progress in the world. But when it comes to the politic point of view, I just want to know what you can answer this question between the West is trying to holding or derail this project. Is it the incident in Indonesia, in Philippines, in New Zealand, and in Sri Lanka, is have any connect 
to this project? Well, some, might, some are nodding. Uh, I don't myself uh, think so. Uh, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't put it past uh, those that are threatened by China's rise uh, to do anything at all to try and stop it. To go back to a point I made earlier, I was there working with the Saudi opposition in London when they were openly discussing using the genuine, real Muslim question in China as a means of uh, dividing China. What is China's main asset? It's united population. So if you are US imperialism, what do you want to do? You, you want to break China up, you want to make it less united, less powerful at the center. My difference with the Chinese government is some of the things that they are doing on the Muslim question are actually making division and break up more likely, not less likely. And so far, they're not listening to me. Go ahead. Uh, I think the gentleman is referring to uh, issues of uh, uh, terrorism attacks. Terrorist attacks, um, yeah. uh, One thing which China has done very well is to um, be if not neutral, they've avoided involving themselves in, in matters that uh, concern, you know, with, with politics, you know, were interfering in politics with uh, different countries. So I think, you know, they've done very well in that. Um, uh, but again, as you know, we all know, one of the things that the, you know, the big states, the U.S. and, and all that are trying to um, uh, uh, put forward is this idea that, you know, um, you know if, if they destabilize the internal security of China, then it literally, you know, um, uh, you know, makes them to be unable to complete, you know, their economic prowess. But that is one thing which China needs to work on, because if you're building these kind of extensive networks, uh, all these, uh, these trade routes, you have to be able to um, have the security architectures, you know, well placed, because again, those are security threats. So I think the, the, the U.S. may have a case in terms of keeping an eye on this infrastructural development, because it poses an, a critical infrastructure threat. Trevor. Can I just say two major things? I think, I think it's absolutely wrong to argue that democracy is not a good thing. It is not the um, suppression of the uh, minority by the majority at all. It, democracy is far more than that. It's about listening to views and taking account of those views. It is not a win-win uh, uh, situation just for those who vote most in, in a certain circumstances. I think that it's totally wrong to argue that for any country in the world that they shouldn't be democratic and somehow it's good for them that they have these people. You don't think that's what happens in democratic countries? I mean, well, in, I, think, in the well, United... I think it's very nuanced, George. I think it's a very nuanced situation, but we must be careful here that we're not arguing for dictatorships. I'm dictatorships not arguing for that. For the rule I'm, ju I'm, just gonna, I'm just going to put this point to you. And it's usually some strong man who then run it in the way that suits them. My main point, though, if I just go on, I mean, I think that's a different debate about what is democracy and how does it work and what de democratic institutions. And it's about them being able to change the state. The nature of the Chinese state under the current leadership is different from the one under Deng Xiaoping. It's, it's a point, it's a fact. He's now made himself virtually unsackable, and that's a bad thing for China, and I think that will lead to a proliferation of mistakes in future if things don't go right. But that's, that's, a, that's my own view on this. So let's, let's just park that for a moment, because as I said, I'm fundamental, a liberal dem Democrat, and I believe that people should have the right to remove their leaders from all, all stratas of power. Um, and I really think that it's, it's disgusting that we argue that it's not the case. Um, the world has moved on um, from the past. I also totally agree that the, 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 the US and uh, Britain and the colonial powers, of course what they did was disgusting. However, we're where we are. And the, the, your, what we're missing in this debate so far, China's rise has not been somehow at the expense of other countries, true, but you must also recognize that it's because it was allowed to join the world trading system that countries such as the US and the other advanced economies were willing to t buy their goods and allow them to invest in China so that their goods could be produced there at, to the enrichment of China. They transfer technology. They allowed this growth to take place. Now, on the one hand, of course, there are other as aspects to it, security aspects. There are the, the, the things that has been pointed to about some of the pushback against China's dominance and so forth in some parts and the willing, an unwillingness maybe to fully accept the ramifications 
of the rise of a country as large and, and important as China undoubtedly is. However, you guys must recognize that Deng Xiaoping opened China to the world. The world embraced China. They allowed it to get as rich as it possibly could through trading openly with the rest of the world. That is why it is as rich as it is today. And I think that we are, and the audience will misunderstand the rise of China. They do not know that this is the case. But capitalism doesn't care about political systems, does it? Otherwise, we wouldn't be trading so gaily with Saudi Arabia, for example. If you want to talk about uh, democracy and human rights, uh, we, we, we buy and sell to Saudi Arabia however many people's heads it cuts off in public on a Friday afternoon, however many people it crucifies. That is absolutely true. But at the same time, it trades with countries. Capitalism can be an ideology for some. But I'm not talking about capitalism, George, as no, an but ideology. It's the, the system specifics, that did the, the trading. Market, the market, China is a market economy, but it is not capitalist. It remains a socialist and communist-run country using the market economy to enrich its citizens. You can do both. Saudi Arabia is a market economy, but is this also a feudal system run by a kleptocracy? A brutal one, undoubtedly, with strong links to certain elements of the US. True, no question. But at the same time, George, that country will trade, uh, the US this is, with other countries who are benign, who don't do these things. This is the world we live in. It can be good and bad. This is, this is the nuance that there is. They don't necessarily choose to trade with countries that are as evil as that regime. And I agree, this is totally an evil regime. And I wish they would stand against it. But they have vested interests there. But they have vested interests elsewhere too. My point is this, ultimately. China too will have vested interests. Once it builds this, this belt and road, once it has assets in these places, it will have to defend these assets. It will have to take positions on the power structures in these countries. That, those relationships will change over time. That's the point I'd like to make about the future for China, given this initiative, which, as I said, will benefit it primarily but it can also benefit those countries depending on how they respond to it. And if they do not respond in a way which benefits their people and their economy, then it won't benefit them at all. It will benefit a kleptocracy, a group at the top, who will get all of the benefits and keep it for themselves. And that happens when they're undemocratic. Must take the gentleman behind you. My name is Musa. And as we can see with China, this is a very ambitious move. So, of course, it's going to be in the eyes of USA as a move of you're trying to step a bit further than you can reach. So China in the long term are going to have to build strong relationships in Africa and through the roads and whatnot. It might not look good to us in the West, but every country needs more infrastructure. Every country needs to progress. And USA just like to stay ahead and keep everyone under the shackles. So in the long term, of course, it's going to be a good thing overall for the majority of the world, as you, if you look at it as a whole and not just singly, then it will be more of a beneficial thing. Thank you I very believe. much. Gentleman at the front. Uh, Fra Hughes, I'm an independent activist from Belfast. I just wanted to make the comment that the only thing you can see from space is the Great Wall of China. And I think that's a huge engineering feat that, uh, that's, that hasn't been surpassed. And I think that this Belt and Road initiative, no matter how long it takes, even if it's decades in the making, is going to open up the whole world from the east through Eurasia all the way to the west. They're talking about delivering things by train from China to London within two weeks. Every single country that it goes through building the infrastructure, the ports and the bridges and the trains uh, and the road networks will allow every one of those countries the opportunity to expand its economy, to use the ports that the Chinese are building. But also China is uh, investing like, between $1 trillion and $3 trillion to make this a reality. Now, I realise that they're also giving loans to a lot of the countries in Africa and along this new Belt and Road that they're developing, and that may cause issues now, in what's going to happen in, in when those countries money. can't pay the loans back? Well, yes, and this has already happened, isn't it, somewhere where they've taken over a port, and it's at Sri Lanka and, and, and one of the countries. But just kind of to finish, I, I think it's a fantastic opportunity. I think going forward, it's already been said, and I totally agree with everything you've said, the cooperation between China is a financial 
and it's it's a financial imperialism in a way where it's going to have influence in all the countries that it goes through financially through the Belt and Road project. But it's also uh, it's not the imperialist way of the West, which through regime change and fermenting terrorism and bombing other countries into uh, uh, subjection. So I just really want to say about the yuan. At some stage, a lot of people predict the yuan become the world reserve currency. And I think when that happens, then America is going to be more frightened of China than it is up to this moment in time. Said Mosin. Uh, yes, uh, Mosin Awas, uh, broadcast journalist. One thing I have to do uh, as a journalist sometimes is to look into the future, crystal ball gazing, really. If China is going to be the emerging economic power of the future, with America not far behind, I can't see it collapsing uh, overnight, some of the futuristic, uh, if you like, technologies are really important to consider uh, in terms of their political and ethical and moral, if you like, overviews. Let's take nanotechnology. Let's take, for instance, robotic engineering. Let's take, um, I don't know, uh, anything which is to do with uh, basically shaping the future of the world. With the Chinese system, one of the concerns would be if you have a totalitarian state where these decisions are made behind closed doors and you don't have the ethical and moral robust kind of decision making, that would be a concern. The problem is, though, that with most of these, uh, most of these technologies and most of the investors within, uh, in, the, in the background, they're primarily after profit. So if profit and economy is driving all of these processes, then consumer producer relations, the way we're going to deal with our future, our populations, how, how we're going to interact is an area which I think that, of course, we all need to be concerned about, particularly though the Chinese, because what is their, what is their sort of cultural or moral kind of uh, outlook to, to such issues? Where do they go in terms of their leadership? Will they, will they just operate according to the transnational corporations whim on these issues more so than perhaps even the West was doing. These are questions in my mind about how will they deal with the well, I'm glad the you future. made that last point because that's exactly what United States dominant uh, capitalist mode does. I mean, you can elect the dog catcher in the United States. You can elect the, the traffic uh, cop. You can, you can elect everybody. But what difference does it make? Uh, Donald Trump's the president. He, he lost the election. You can only stand for president with a chance of winning if you've got a billion dollars to spend and nothing changes. What's the difference between Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, Donald Trump? To what extent is this democracy of which you speak of any importance to the mass of the people in the United States? 35 million people in the United States have no health care cover. Uh, 50 million people in the United States could not survive a $1,000 emergency. So if you've got a system like the Chinese system, which is not democratic according to our uh, definition of democratic, but everyone's getting richer and richer and the public realm is getting better and better, which is best? I, I think ultimately uh, I, I'm with you on this, but social justice and being able to define what that future is at the moment seems to be still locked in this kind of paradigm of growth, economic growth. We seem to be obsessed with growth as if it's an uh, in, in untouchable reality of our times. Growth is not an absolute reality. This is a reality which usurious money lending mechanisms and systems which capitalism has imposed on the world uh, dictate to us. Have the Chinese broken free from, from that kind of usurious uh, uh, model or have they complied with these transnational sort of uh, usurious money lending mechanism? Is that why they're being allowed to interact? Have they just sold out just like the Americans sold out a century ago? So uh, my, my thing about it, my question is really about ethics and morality of politics, moral politics politics and does that moral politics exist on the spectrum whether it's with China or whether it's with Western democracies and if it doesn't isn't that where we, we ought to be focusing to change the, the narratives that we're giving
given by the, the hierarchical elites and who filter it through the media, through their levers of power, the politics, the economic systems. Uh, I'm, I'm really all for a big debate and discussion about moral politics and a new vision, a different vision from simply being driven by growth and profit and, and, and the need. And I accept that we need to eradicate poverty. It's a transformational uh, process, not a revolutionary mm. one. I get that. But is anybody committed to that? I'm not well, sure. Uh, well, I'm committed to a debate uh, on it. I, I just make this point to you, uh, that um, the people who rail against growth are usually the people that are already rich uh, rather than the people that want to be. Yes. Hi, it's Amir, Amir Bellin. Um, I was just uh, getting warmer and warmer to, towards the point I wanted to make um, in the programme. And it's about um, with any new trade deal or business uh, deals they've got um, in the pipeline, my biggest concern has always been who benefits from it because it doesn't ever seem to be the poorest of the West uh, or the East. For example, there's these uh, rules in China where if you're below a certain amount um, in terms of uh, wealth, you're not allowed to travel or buy uh, an aeroplane ticket. Um, in England, if you're on benefits, you're not allowed to leave the country unless you've secured a job first, even under freedom of movement. So my, my, my issue has been is like, yes, we can have all these new great ideas and schemes and trade deals, but we can't have it where it's just a certain section of society that gets to go to the UAE and benefit with the great jobs there, and, and then a certain section of society that gets to get into the Silk Road and whatever China's doing and, you know... Isn't that true everywhere? I mean, I have the... We, we need, we need the know, poorest people. When, poorest I was, when I was your age, I had the right to go and take tea in the Ritz, but I didn't have the money to do it. So right. the right to do it wasn't actually all that important. That's correct. So, you know, same, same here. You know, I work, you know, as you know yourself, in a car trade, driving lots of nice cars. I can't afford one of these nice cars, but I, I can drive every single one and I can tell you everything about every single one, you know, until the cows go home. But what I'm saying is, like, with, with all these new things out there, you know, again, capitalism, what we brought, endless growth, um, people don't want to fail. It's, they don't want to say, oh, OK, we, we sold a little bit less this year. It doesn't matter. Let's uh, try a bit harder next year. There's, there's no room for failure. Everything's always just kind of a KPI-type system of, Profit, 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 profit. And, you know, if you lose out, that's it. You've lost out. You're a loser. Mm. And that's the end mm. of your career and everything. And mm. do you see, I, mean, I, just, I just want, if we're going to have these new schemes, we've got to have it where the poorest people of the world can benefit as well. Not just as, you know, people from the grammar schools and the private schools. They know about all the good stuff first and they benefit from it. And then everyone else finds that 20 years later. That, oh, why didn't we do that? Do you know what I mean? Mm. So this is what my problem is. Again, if we're going to do these new, you know, like same with the Pakistan thing, you know, when we discussed mm. with Imran mm. Khan. Mm. Mm. Great, they've got some new ideas and that in the pipeline, but involve some of the people that have not had a piece of the cake yet. Yeah. Adam, it is a paradox, isn't it? You've got, you've got a communist party with all the emblems and the colours and as red as Trevor socks. Uh, <laughs> but actually what they're pursuing is capitalism. Uh, and uh, you can't vote them out. Uh, the, the, they, they, have, uh, they have the authority of being a communist revolutionary government which overthrew uh, foreign domination, united the country, and so on. But they don't actually practice socialism, so why should they be allowed to fly the banner and stay in power, apparently, in perpetuity? Well, it's socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era, to, to coin the precise phrase. But going back a bit further to the late 70s, it was Dong who came up with probably my favorite quote of all time. I don't care if a cat is black or white, so long as it catches mice. It's all about problem solving, and that's what politics is. Politics isn't an exercise in vanity or monopolizing money, monopolizing the airwaves, monopolizing force. It's about solving problems, the people's problems, as many people and as many problems as one can solve. And let's imagine this studio were to be put into a time capsule. Everything that's been said is indeed relevant today. In less than 20 years' time, all of the jobs, the working class jobs, the middle class jobs, I would say the upper class jobs, but at least in England they don't have jobs, they don't need them, <laughs> but the jobs themselves are going to be they're going to be transferred from the fleshy hand to the robotic hand, artificial intelligence. And there is going to be a moment when the penny drops, where 
people are going to say, look, who is working for who? Are we working for the machines or are the machines working for us? Now, no system has totally come to terms with this yet, but the fundamental structure that China has whereby money circulates rather than goes down a one-way street to who knows where. Well, we know, we but do know where. In, indeed. <laughs> this is going to be a model that many other countries will have to look at and how to adapt it in a flexible way to their own cultural characteristics and the own economy that they want for their people. Trevor, last word to you. Uh, Dan Xiaoping also said to be rich is glorious. It is. And uh, the more people... But hear me... The better. Uh, yeah, and he said that because he believed in spreading wealth through using the market economy. Mm -hmm. And so arguments against the market economy, in my view, are define the facts of the history of the world over the last 50 years, which is that the world is richer than it's ever been before. You, you do have disparities in income, absolutely, but you have the opportunity, even if you're poor, George, even if you can't go to the Ritz today, you have the right to go there. Your children may be able to go there if you do the right no, thing. I can go and there the now, right thing you can do now, yes. And you do go now, I'm sure. Um, but that's the point. The world changes. And one way you change the world is through education, education, education. But this, this view somehow that the um, nirvana of uh, the communist state uh, is the future of the world, in my view, is wrong. I think it's the communist states that are going to have to adjust to the fact that the world is freer, more dynamic than ever before, and that they have to embrace that. Uh, and it's simply not true that the welfare system in China is better than the welfare system in the US, for example. US welfare system is not as good as ours in the UK, but the, the, the Chinese one doesn't even cover their people. If you can't afford to pay, they have no national health care system. Um, so they have a long way to go. The average Chinese is six, time, six times poorer than the average American. So they have to get a lot richer before they begin to be first world in the sense that you've described it earlier, George. It's been marvelous for me. I hope it was for you. I've been George Galloway. This has been Kale Mahorra.